If a little green is good, more is even better. Now, back to Green is Good with John Shigarian and Mike Brady. Welcome back to Green is Good, and we are so thankful today to have Nick Rosen on from London. He is an award-winning documentary maker, journalist, and broadcaster, and he's probably the premier expert in the world on off-the-grid living. Welcome to Green is Good, Nick Rosen. Hi, great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. (laughs) Hey, Nick, tell us a little bit. What does off-the-grid life really mean, and how did you become interested in it? Well, what it means, it does vary from one person to another. It's kind of, in a way, it's a movable concept. But literally speaking, it just means living without utility, power, and water, you know, without those lines coming in to your place from the outside. But it also has a more metaphorical meaning of just kind of disconnecting from the system, whether that's the utilities or maybe, you know, the car or banking or you know, just, uh, you know, or even working. And some people even live without any ID of any sort, no passport, no Social Security. You know, Americans who are there, you know, living here legally, but nevertheless uh, have chosen not to just be part of the system. So, so, you know, Nick, you have done so many amazing things. and, And tell us a little bit how you got interested in this and how long have you actually been engaging and also evangelizing off the grid living? Well, there's a sort of personal story to it and a, and a kind of more political story to it. Sure. And the political story is I was in New York in um, 2003 making a documentary for PBS Frontline at the time. And I got caught up in that huge power outage back then, if you remember, in the, in, in the summer of 2003. Sure. Yeah. 50 million homes went suddenly were without power. I was on my way to the airport at the time. Of course, I didn't get on the plane. And I was uh, sitting around in New York, um, you know, listening to the radio and waiting for a flight back, back out again. And I began to think about the grid and about why it was run the way it is and what had made it the way it was. And I was listening to representatives of the American electrical industry saying that what was needed was more public money to be pumped in to make the grid more resilient. And I really began to think, I wonder if there's a better way. Gotcha. And increasingly, as I looked into it, I decided that this $400 billion a year electricity industry, you know, well, it's one of the greatest engineering achievements of the 20th century, but I'm not sure it's any longer fit for purpose. And I'm not sure that if it didn't exist, we would actually need to invent it these days because technology has moved on. And uh, it's quite possible to generate energy locally now. We don't really need the grid in the same way that we did 100 years ago, but I'm not even sure we needed it then. So there's that whole kind of political right. uh, aspect, to what, you know, industrial aspect to what I'm doing. Gotcha. But also it's a very personal thing because um, over 10 years ago, I, I happened to cross a lovely little um, shepherd's hut up in the mountains in Mallorca near a beautiful spot where a poet called Robert Graves had first settled and Chopin, the composer, had come there. And it's just completely unspoilt olive grove with a few sheep. And uh, and I bought this this few acres for like $7,000, even though it was near a kind of millionaire's village where um, Michael Douglas and Jack Nicholson go there every summer. And, uh, but I'd I'd found my little spot, my piece of heaven. And, and, Of course, I've got it because it was all I could afford at the time. (laughs) But then I discovered that actually living this way was really quite comfortable. It wasn't that difficult. Wow! The wood, you know, from the olive trees was was uh, went into the wood burning stove and a a couple of solar panels, and gathering rainwater was um, well not something I could do on my own. I got I got the locals in and they made a beautiful um, estanca. It's called you know with a stone lining. So that, I could, so that I could have water up there. But I just found that it was this combination of ancient wisdom of how to make a water tank that, that keeps your water pure, coupled with solar panels. It just seemed like the perfect solution to a problem that more and more people were worrying about, which was how do we live a good life on Earth you know, and survive and without you know, adding further to the pollution. Got it. So it's both political and personal, which is fascinating. And of course, you've written a wonderful new book called Off the Grid, which can be found on Amazon.com or on your website, www.off-grid.net. So why don't you give us some of the top tips for our listeners who want to go, go off the grid? 
How do they do it? Yeah, well, for, I mean, if it's for them, I mean, it's not for everybody. But I think the most important thing about to say about off-grid is that it's an option. It really is an option. It's a perfectly reasonable choice that anybody can make these days because the technology is there. And you don't have to do it all in one go. You can start by just putting a couple of solar panels on your roof and maybe just taking one room off the grid and having you know, your spare room, which, has got, which is lit by solar, solar power and where you've maybe got a, a bit of rainwater uh, tank on the roof that's feeding into a sink. And that way, you know, you can feel that your household has got a bit of resilience in it. If the water supply does dry up or if the power does go out, um, you've got somewhere in the house where you can read and turn the light on and wash. So that's, so that's a kind of, you know, minimalist approach. Um, another way, of course, is just to get into an RV and go somewhere that isn't a campsite. Gotcha. And, uh, you know, just be in a field. So you have, you, um, you, you've been, bl- you know, Nick, you've been blessed to both live in the UK and the US. How does, how do the two countries compare if you want to live off the grid? And what have been your experiences in both countries living off the grid? Well, America is infinitely better than Britain. I mean, don't forget Britain, you know, uh, although it's uh, got a, a big old culture, it's about the size of Kansas. And so basically <laughs> it's a tiny crowded island where everybody's struggling for a bit of elbow room. And there are so many rules and regulations that stop you just buying a bit of woodland and moving into it and living a good life. But in America, the rules vary much more from county to county. So, that, you know, there are some, of course, you know, expensive parts of, of the country where it's quite hard to just turn up and, and set up a homestead. But all over America, you can buy land, move on, build yourself a home, power it with solar panels, dig a, dig a well, and you're away, and you know, for you know, as little as twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars, you can have a home, a comfortable home that's fully operational. That's that's amazing. So, why don't you share a couple of the economic benefits to living off the grid? No matter where you live off the grid, how does it affect people personally in their in their pocketbook? Well, it depends on the person, of course. Some <laughs> people uh, have got no money, right? And for people with you know, little or no money, right. off the grid is an option to live uh, a decent life. Right. Um, because you might get some very small patch of land for free or borrow it or rent it or buy it for a few hundred dollars, literally. Right. And then you can just move on in whatever you've got, whether it's a caravan or you can build a, a shed quite easily for a few hundred dollars. And then a couple of solar panels for a couple of hundred dollars each so we're talking about a couple of thousand dollars now, you can have some kind of a shelter right. where, you can, where you can power a light and a phone, you know, a cell phone, and, and you're away. You can, you can start earning a living. At the other end of the scale, um, I did visit, in the book I talk about visiting people with millions who'd chosen to get themselves a kind of bug-out location because a lot of people right. choose the off-grid life because they think that for environmental reasons, um, we're heading into a difficult period where there could be a, a social collapse or a right. economic collapse or an environmental collapse. So, I mean, are some of those folks well-known? Are they are celebrities or are they just uh, high net worth folks? Uh, well, who do you write a about? In the- I, I suppose one of the best known who's, uh, who's decided to do this is, is Daryl Hannah. Oh, the, the, the film star, sure. yeah. and she's got herself a, a completely off-grid place in Colorado near Telluride, and she's now got herself a second off-grid home somewhere in Northern California, but I, I haven't been to that one. And uh, there's a, a big-time venture capitalist called John Doerr, sure. D O E R R, yeah, yeah, uh, and he launched uh, an amazing new fuel cell called the Bloom Box. You should have him on your show. Huh. And John says that his interest in life is the next big thing and he's um got himself a huge off-grid ranch in half moon bay near san francisco well you know your your island spot really does sound like a slice of heaven in your book do you talk about some of the great places to that are the most appealing for off the grid living i do in america yeah right. and um and they and, and they in a way you, you could predict what they're going to be northern california of course because it's just beautiful there. You've got a large existing off-grid population, so people understand you and welcome you when you turn up. Gotcha. The skills are there, the technology base is there to, for somebody to come and wire up your, your solar panels and, 
help you get your uh, your composting toilet working because you're going to need one of those <laughs> and uh, and so you've got a combination of the right kind of weather and you've got the availability of water you've got forest and woodland so those those are some of the things you need north carolina is another one of my favorite spots for going off grid well, and again the, the people there are pretty welcoming towards that lifestyle Florida also has a lot of the right uh, characteristics. It's got the weather and it's got the, the, the land. But the people in Florida are perhaps a bit less welcoming of that lifestyle in certain parts. I went down to the Keys and there's a little island, the no-name key it's called, with just 43 homes. And it's completely off the grid. But recently people have started buying there who don't want to be off the grid. Oh. And so now there's a kind of battle going on. There's two sides, you know, and they're suing each other about whether oh. to stay off the grid or not. Oh. And I uh, describe it all in the book. It's almost comical if it wasn't quite serious. You know, Nick, you're, you're the first person we've ever had on this show to talk about this subject. Is it still a rather obscure lifestyle? And if it is, what what does the growth of it look like compared to when you started living off the grid and started thinking about it? What has the recent years shown you and what do you think the future of living off the grid is? It's very fast growing now. For, for for a, for a number of reasons. It's partly because as, as the economy continues to tank, ah. people are finding that they're getting foreclosed and that this is a real genuine option. Good point. And people are also discovering that it's comfortable. So the combination of the need and the technology having improved and being more affordable means that it's growing at, at least at 15% a year now. So right now, there's probably about 600,000 off-grid households in America, which is not a huge amount, I mean, no. but it's a significant number. It means there's over a million Americans living off the grid. Wow. And growing, as I said, about 15% a year, maybe more. And that could, that could uh, increase at any time because the only thing that's stopping it is the kind of knowledge that it's so possible. And when I say it's possible, what I mean is that you can put yourself a perfectly... Uh, adequate um, uh, electricity setup for about $15,000. And then oh. you'll never have to pay an electricity bill again. But what I mean by adequate is you can run all the things that you normally run in your normal house, including a washing machine and a TV, but you wouldn't be able to run them all at the same time. So you would definitely want to turn the plasma screen off whilst you were running the washing machine. So you do have to kind of learn to adjust your life. But that's a good thing because at the moment, you know, we just walk around and live our lives um, consuming huge amounts of energy quite unnecessarily. But if we just put in a little bit more thought, we'd be able to live a cheaper and uh, uh, less polluting lifestyle. Well, definitely, Nick. We, you, you talk about living a more conscious and more deliberate lifestyle. But let me ask yeah. you this. You say for about $15,000 the typical American home could generate uh, its own electrical needs. But would that uh, require any kind of rewiring or anything? Would we, You know, because we're used to just plugging it in and uh, just using whatever appliance we need. Would there be anything towards that yeah. that would have to be addressed no, as well? No. I mean, the stages are that you have your solar panels, or it might be a wind turbine, depending on which part of the country you live in, or both. Right. And then you pass the power through something called an inverter, which is just a box that sits on the wall. And that inverter turns the 12-volt power from the solar panels into 110. Okay. Well, we're and, used and to And you're it. away. Okay. And, then any, and, of course, in a normal home, which is already connected to the grid, mm -hmm. any surplus power you can just sell back to the grid. Okay, gotcha. So that it's not wasted. So, Nick, uh, now, now that you, t you, you blew Mike and I eyeballs and ears wide open here that there's 600,000 in the U.S. And, 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 and it's 10 to 15, it growing at a rate of at least 10 to 15 percent a year. So it's, it's really then all the, not all the off the gridders are lonely tree huggers. There's a huge community and it's growing. Can you talk a little bit about how, how this movement is going to continue to grow both here in the United States and in other parts of the world as great people and experts like you continue? to evangelize all the benefits of it? Absolutely. I think that um, the other factor that's important for off-the-grid and the growth of off-the-grid living is wireless internet. Because, you know, I could turn up at a, a, a arid piece of the desert in West Texas mm. and meet some people who'd left New York to go and live in a trailer uh, running their, their energy with a generator because they hadn't installed their solar panels yet. But what they had managed to get 
was for sixty dollars a month they've got the satellite internet and they're working they're sitting in their trailer in the desert working for some new york publishing company doing research online and earning a living <laughs> and uh, so that's what is going to make it possible for that is hundreds of thousands more people to have it all to be able to continue you know being brain workers you know but leave the city take their families somewhere beautiful buy some cheap land and set themselves up and i think it's that combination it's the it's the wireless internet plus the um, the, the power technology and the availability of the technology and of course it's getting cheaper all the time as the the new solar panel factories begin to come on stream you know well one of the things that uh, you're talking about nick I, I think there's a little bit of an escapist in in most of us thinking boy wouldn't it be nice to go someplace live off the land but yeah, you know, maybe the startup cost could be a little bit more than what we need i noticed on your site you've got a very cool thing called land buddy you want to talk to us about that a little bit yeah, that's uh, relatively new, but it's it's uh, getting a lot of uh, of attention, a lot of people signing up for it. And it's there to just, it's a free service that just facilitates people getting together with other people because you don't want to go off the grid on your own. Very few people are going to have all the skills. I mean, some people do, and my goodness, I admire them. But, you know, to be able to do electrics and plumbing and building and dealing with lawyers and dealing with, um, you know, the, the local county and the building regulations... So much better to get a few of you together, buy the land together. Ah. There's safety in numbers, and there's, yeah. there's a variety of skills as well. So you can, you can mark a place on the map where you're thinking of going off-grid, and you can scan the map. It's just a Google mashup, it's called. And you can see who else is thinking of going off-grid in your area and get in touch with them and make announcements and upload videos. Uh, and generally, uh, we're just trying to kind of create a global off-grid community as we go along. And, you know, and Nick's amazing book for our listeners out there is called Off the Grid. It can be found on Amazon.com or on his website, www.off-grid.net. Nick, now tell us now, you had, you wrote this book as you traveled across America and you and you met all sorts of interesting people. And I, wanted, I want you to talk about that journey a little bit, but before you get into that, Tell us about what's the strangest off-grid experience you've ever had. I think, I mean, there are so many, it's hard to know where to start, but I think probably <laughs> the strangest image that I've still got in my mind from that amazing trip yeah. was a horse on an escalator. And I'll tell you why. I went to visit the, the Old Order Mennonites, you know, the Amish people in uh, Liberty, Kentucky, outside of Liberty, Kentucky. And... I met the most fantastically skilled and wise and charming family who are running a $3 million a year engineering business out in the middle of nowhere, wow. doing very, you know, sort of cutting unusual patterns out of metal, you know, on behalf of clients who make washing machines or whatever. Sure. But they don't believe in using electricity, the Mennonites. Hmm. They don't believe in it. They believe that electricity brings bad things in and, and you know, and that's their belief, which I respect. But uh, they do need power. They need power to power their, their tools to cut the metal, and they need it to run their refrigerators and so on. So what they do is they build a treadmill out of wood, which they grow themselves, and then the horse gets on the treadmill, and they call it green power. They said the horse eats grass, and it makes power. That's green power. Wow. And so I watched this horse going up <laughs> on the treadmill, and I asked, does, it, does the horse mind? They said, no, it's good exercise for the horse. The horse is happy. And it... <laughs> It's, uh, it creates motive power, you know, it's sure. not electricity, it's actually sure. turning a, ha a spindle, and the spindle is turning a motor, and the motor is cooling down their cool box to keep their, their meat fresh, and that kind of thing. So that was the most eye-opening thing, but there were many others. Well, and there's an example, real easy, I mean, even a child could see, when you ask what, you know, how big is that engine, you say it's one horsepower. <laughs> it's, it's real simple. I mean, that, because truly, that's what it, it really is. is. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you yeah. know, Nick, in your travels across the U.S., how many states did you visit? I didn't get to all of them. I, I, I guess I, you know, I could have uh, made it into a lifetime's exploration. Right. But uh, I spent about a year, and I, I just traveled to about fifteen states altogether. I wow. think. Wow. Wow. And uh, California, of course, and Oregon, Florida, Texas, and New York. 
were kind of, you know, th- those five are the sort of key off-grid states, I think. And what went but into... of course, there's, there's yeah. people living off the grid in every state. Sure. But what was... Then tell us a little bit the impetus to your planning. Why did you choose the, these certain states and how did you plan it? Well, I had the benefit of having the website to be able to contact people and let people know that I was um, right. writing the book. Right. And so it was, it was partly uh, people just getting in touch with me and... Um, partly just following my nose you know i'd go to california because obviously that's one place and i went up to ukiah which of course is traditionally um part one of the centers of the uh, cannabis growing industry Mm. because i knew that cannabis growing had for a long time been an off-grid industry gotcha Gotcha. and um i was uh you know i was put in touch with pot growers and i learned that in fact that the pot growing industry had been very important in the development of solar panels because the, the first customers for solar panels were the pot growers. There you go. Because they had a problem. They needed power. They were up in the hills. They didn't like, especially at harvest time, to come back down into town buying gasoline. Fascinating. So they, they were really, they helped push the green revolution forward. Yes, you know, in more ways than one. <laughs> hey, listen, what you know? Talk about a little bit about off-grid homes, and what are some of the models you saw in your wonderful journeys? Well, I said if you want to sum up in one word, yeah, it would have to be small. I think uh, you know, here we are point. in the middle of what is really a housing crisis in America, and I yep. have to say that one reason for that for that crisis, for the way that prices have fallen and people have, have been foreclosed, is that for a long time, people were held out an ideal of a home that was really too big, unnecessarily big. I mean, yeah, it's, you know, it's nice to spread out, but a big home means costs more to build, it costs more to heat, it costs more to maintain. And when you're short of energy, you know, when you're sitting in the middle of the wood and you haven't got electricity and you haven't got gas and you're just relying on your own, you know, on your own fire or solar panels to keep you warm, you suddenly realize that actually a smaller house is, is much easier to heat and easier to cool and easier to maintain. Perfect. So small is beautiful, as, um, as the old uh, 1960s environmentalist used to say. So that was one thing I learned was small. Got it. And then another thing I learned was that really you can be at home anywhere. It's just oh. a question of attitude. You know, and, and uh, an ability to be happy. So I met people who were living in yurts, you know, which is a kind of um, Mongolian tent that the Mongolian uh, nomads used to live in all their lives. Unbelievable. Very sturdy, thick tent. And I met people who were building A-frame, wooden A-frame houses in the woods. And, uh, you know, just a huge variety of, of sheds and shacks and RVs. But if there was one... If there was one uh, type of design that really sums up the off-grid movement, it's probably something called the Earthship. Now, I'm not necessarily endorsing the Earthship, but it's an extraordinary idea because Earthships are built out of old tires. And it's a great solution, really. Here are all these old tires littering the planet, which are very hard to recycle. Absolutely. Once the tread's been worn off them, there's not much you can do with them. Right. So somebody had the idea of just piling them up, Mm. And filling them full of earth, which is incredibly time-consuming and labor-intensive. Right. But they then become, they have huge thermal mass, these walls. Huh. So as a result, they hold the heat and, they, and they, uh, they don't require a lot of heating inside once you've built one of these houses. Wonderful. You know, Nick, unfortunately, we've come to the end of this wonderful discussion with you. We are so thankful for the time you've spent on Green is Good, and your story is so amazing. We're going to have you back on at a later date to continue it, because I know our listeners are going to respond so well to it. Again, for all listeners out there, you could read more about Nick Rosen and his amazing journeys and about living off the grid in his book, Off the Grid, which you can find on Amazon.com or wwwoff grid net Nick Rosen you are truly living proof that green is good